Dwyer, I'm, I'm Clay Penny's uh, advisor. And um, this is pretty much just does entire introduction for, uh, for myself. Clay's, uh, Clay's work has been, has capitalized off a recent interest in, um, in our space program. And on this past year, we've had the first landing of Virgin Atlantic, of, uh, of rather the, let's say, the uh, Virgin Galactic. We've had our SpaceX first landing, the first Chinese lunar landing. There's been a lot of talk about uh, manned missions to Mars. But long before this, 10 years ago, it was the start of an intercollegiate competition called Battle of the Rockets. It's both high school and, co and college divisions, but the college division has been uniquely difficult. In the 10 years it's been running, there's not been a single college that's managed to solve the, uh, the problem. The problem is that it has uh, many different areas of engineering that it touches. It's, it's got electrical engineering, it's got computer engineering, there's a, there's a big mechanical engineering, obviously aerospace engineering. I'd say the biggest challenge of it though is in the project management side. This year it's being held in Virginia. So I thought it would be a perfect multidisciplinary engineering challenge for Matt Penny's thesis project. And I will let him explain how he's managed the team of cadets to address the problem. Thank you, Colonel Square. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. As Colonel Square said, I'm Matt Penny, and this is the Mars River Project. So, a brief little project summary. As Colonel Square said, this is the Mars River Competition. It's hosted by the Federation of Galaxy Explorers, and it is technically the overall thing is the Battle of the Rockets competition, and there are three other sub-competitions for various age groups, one of the hardest one being the Mars River Competition, and they go in descending order. So, a little bit of motivation for this project. Like Colonel Squire said, this is a, it's a project that's never been completed before. No one's ever actually been able to do steps A through Z and be successful with everything. And that was a, a big motivating factor for me whenever it was first introduced to me in uh, late March of last year. And since then, it's been pretty much work nonstop on this project. I spent uh, many nights at Colonel Squire's house this summer uh, eating dinner with his family and building this. That, believe it or not, that took about 65 hours of just my time. Squire and I put in, you know, together. So, to get into the actual competition, here's a, a wonderful CAD drawing uh, made by Cadet Singh of what we're actually uh, designing for and then actually executing. So we're going to have a, the rocket launch and an apogee, which has to be above 1,000 feet in altitude. And then at apogee, we deploy the Mars rover and it parachutes and descends. And a key regular, a key uh, clause in the contest rules safely. You can't just have something dart in the ground and, and call it good and take the points from the, the first half of the contest. That's, you're, you're disqualified if you do that. So once it lands, the, the rocket has to be safely recovered and then the rover has to go through some ground operations, including a forward movement followed by a soil collection and then taking a picture of where it just collected soil. Upon uh, the completion of that picture, the contest is over and the judges have now moved in to actually A bit of a mission summary, more of an, a word form. The uh, only thing different with this slide is that uh, the picture can be transmitted to a remote controller, which also issues the command to collect the soil and take the picture. And if the picture is displayed on the remote controller, we get bonus points. However, like I said, it's not a requirement. Here are some uh, hard constraints established by the contest. Most notably, the rover has to be under two kilograms in overall weight. And uh, as for the rocket, there's uh, various uh, classifications of motors, and the biggest restriction on our rocket is that we have to use a K motor, and I'll get more into that in a minute. So, and uh, now for some uh, in-depth like rocket design. This is a, a CAD rendering of our overall rocket design. It's eight inches in diameter and 11 feet long. It's got three fins for stability located back here on the lower airframe. This is also where the motor and the motor tube is located in this area. Above that, we have the avionics ring. That's where all the electronics and for the rocket are contained. Here in the upper airframe, that's where we have our payload, our parachute for our rocket and for a separate nose cone and also for the rover itself. That's where everything is stored. And up here is the nose cone, like I said, that has a separate parachute. When it's all said and done and this thing's painted, loaded up with a rover and an engine and sitting on the launch pad, it'll weigh just over 61 pounds. And for something this size, that is a pretty small, but for the, our engine limitation, that's actually very heavy. So, a little bit about our rocket recovery. 
delivery system. Like I said, we've got three parachutes, one for the nose cone, one for the rest of the rocket, and then one for the Mars rover itself. <coughs> Apogee, we're going to have a flight computer uh, blow an ejection charge, which is essentially just black powder. And at that moment, the nose cone is going to fly off forward, and its parachute is connected to a deployment bag, which is also connected to the main parachute, effectively pulling everything out of that upper airframe. This will ensure that everything opens correctly and is separated so we don't have any tangling and everything can come down independently. As far as the rear of the rocket is concerned, everything is supposed to stay together. Right here in the lower half of the avionics bay to the uh, lower airframe, we're connected with uh, three nylon screws. These are pretty big screws that aren't supposed to break, but then just as a redundant backup, we have a green strap right here as a, as a some extra retention in case the screws were to break, everything is still held together with the strap. That way we can still descend safely and still qualify for the contest. So our rocket electronics are actually very simple. We use two flight computers because of redundancy and we can uh, eliminate some complexity and lower the risk of both of these flight computers have barometric pressure sensors on them. This is how we're able to tell altitude. And they're able to do that as well as they do because we have what we call static ports on the avionics bay. And really all that is is a quarter inch diameter hole drilled into the side, and that allows the pressure to equalize between the ambient air outside and what's inside. It also allows for that equalization so we don't uh, explode when we go up in the air and the pressure is low outside and inside. And like I said, the, uh, the nose cone since it has to break off, it's held together with two very small screws, actually called shear pins, so they shear in half. And the pins that aren't supposed to shear in half are called non-shear pins, because we're engineers and not very creative. And those are attached to the upper and lower half of the avionics plane. So here's our overall design schematic for our rocket electronics. We've got our main flight computer, followed by our redundant flight computer. Each one has its own independent switch and battery, and again, that is for redundancy in case something were to fail, either during launch or at ejection, we, we still have a backup that can carry out the same mission. You'll see here that we have uh, four, two terminal blocks here, dedicated as the main, and then two over here dedicated as the drogue. This is because we've set this rocket up for what's called dual deployment, meaning at Apogee, it is designed to deploy a very small parachute so we can have a moderately controlled descent, and then at a reasonable altitude, we can deploy a main parachute, which will greatly slow the descent and reduce the chances of lateral drift because it's a lot lower to the ground. That way we don't have to run as far to go get it when we're done. However, with this project, since we're at such a low altitude, a thousand feet, we have not set it up to do this, but this is just so we can use it later on in a future project. This is an expensive thing that we can reuse multiple times if we want to. So, as far as our rocket motor selection goes, we're using what's called a K1 Triple Nine N, and this delivers a thrust and pad weight ratio of 7.29, which is an equivalent of about 450 pounds of force. This follows the guidelines of the contest of having a 5 to 1 ratio or greater. And conveniently enough, this motor is actually the only motor of its kind that is a K classification that will uh, get us to the right altitude safely and have the correct th thrust to weight ratio. This backup motor you see here, the K458W, that is a, a contest a specific requirement of having done a trade selection and found a backup motor. While it doesn't work for us, we'd actually, uh, it'd be incredibly uh, hard to tell what we'd actually do if we were to use this. However, we bought several extra of the K1999Ns, and in fact, we have the only three remaining in the continental United States, as our belief, thanks to uh, some manufacturing uh, defects Here we have a motor simulation plot of what it actually looked like when we uh, programmed this whole thing to test before we flew for the first time. And as you can see, we got to about 1,150 feet, which surpasses our requirement for the contest and gives us a little bit of wiggle room should it be really windy or we need to add extra weight to the rover for some reason or anything like that. And you can see that our flight time concludes after about 26 seconds we've returned back to the ground. So this is a very quick operation. Now for a little more detail on the Mars rover. So the overall design of the rover, it's made of two aluminum laminate plates as the chassis. They're sandwiched together using some standoffs. 
And the idea is that it has to fit inside the rocket, obviously. So it's only 12 inches long and seven inches wide as a maximum point. And it, uh, it uses a ESP32 microcontroller as its main processing unit. And this is Wi-Fi capable. And I'll get into more as to why we selected that in a minute. We have four independent drive motors located here, 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 and here. And they're independent in case we do have a failure. Let's say one of them breaks whenever we land. We still have three more. And we've actually proven through testing that we are able to move the required distance and then to actually flex soil still. And these white things here you see are called wegs. They're a cross between a wheel and a leg. For the contest, we get a lot of bonus points if we don't use anything that is a wheel or track. So when Carl Swinner and I were thinking of ways to, to do this and still get all those points, we found this idea on the internet. The University of West Virginia had done a cockroach type of motion experiment using these. And they actually, they looked really cool to me. So I thought I'd ask if they'd be useful because they're not a full wheel. And so the contest organizer got back to me and said they are, they're good. You can use them. So we get the full points. And the other really cool thing about these is that they can traverse obstacles twice their height. So when we get to the contest and we're flying in a cornfield that's been harvested, so we might have corn stalks that's still about six to 12 inches tall, we can maneuver over those readily without needing a separate navigation system to go around. As I said, we've got four legs for our locomotion method, and that's just a, a nice picture of what they look like. These bottle caps are used for soil collection. And here's what we do for soil collection. Whenever we're ready to collect soil and a command is issued from the microcontroller, we have the back legs spin forward and the front legs spin in reverse, thus effectively working against each other, but they dig into the ground. And these toenails, or bottle caps in a sense, they scoop through the dirt, and as they come up, the dirt then falls through this chute here, and there's going to be a tray right here to collect the dirt when it gets up to the top. Effectively uh, making two, uh, two system requirements uh, checked off with one system. As far as our rover descent, some of you might be wondering, well, what happens whenever that, uh, that black powder charge goes off and there's all that pressure inside the, the upper airframe to push the nose cone off onto what happens to the rover? So we've designed against that by having a Sabo round, if you will. And this is literally just made out of a foam roller you can go find down in Cop Hall. We didn't use any of those we bought our own. <laughs> It actually works very well. It's very pressure resistant, and we actually found that it's relatively flame retardant. This one you see here, there's a uh, bit of a black marking down here from where it's been burned a few times. We've used this one six times, I believe, to uh, actually eject with a black powder charge and testing, and it still works very well. This uh, Sabo is only gonna cover the back half of the rover, and that's to make sure it can get out of the rocket easily, and it can pull apart the moment it gets out into the open air. If it doesn't, then it's going to continue to cover two legs all the way down. The parachute might not open, and that's those are bad things. So that's why it only covers the back half. As far as the parachute for the rover is concerned, it's a 36 inch, 36 inch diameter parachute, which gives us about a descent rate of a little bit less than five meters per second. Something that's not going to drift really far away, but it's not going to come down like a brick. So the parachute is attached to a metal actuator, as diagrammed here. And the actuator will retract whenever we come within Wi-Fi connection distance with the microcontroller at the contest. This wasn't a contest requirement. In fact, it was very vague uh, when the robot was supposed to start executing all the commands whenever uh, we're actually at the launch site. So we designed it so that whenever our handheld controller comes within the right distance for our microcontroller and they can talk back and forth, that the actuator is going to automatically retract thus releasing this spring right here to then pop this string farther away and get it out of the way of the rover. This will reduce the chances of it getting caught in the legs and preventing us from moving far enough. This is a nice diagram about our rover payload integration. So when it all comes down to it, we're going to have the main parachute uh, packed relatively tightly up against the ejection charges right here and we're going to protect it with a, a deployment bag which is made of Kevlar and then a separate uh, Nomex blanket placed over top of the ejection charges and that's just to protect the shroud lines. We don't want anything to get burned and compromise the parachute in that ejection. So that will be 
followed by the Mars rover within its Sabo and having a dome parachute attached to the front. And then lastly, we will have the nose cone parachute in right about here. And like I said, that acts as a, a pilot chute, if you will, or, because it's able to pull everything out and get it out in the open whenever it gets ejected because it'll be moving the fastest out of all the hoppers. So it's, uh, it's worthy of note, our rover mass at the moment is just over 1,100 grams. Like I said, we're at a two kilogram maximum. So if we find the next week or two that we really need to add something that'll give us extremely better chances of winning or something breaks and the only alternative is something very different, we have plenty of room to work with. So this is a block diagram of our rover electronics. We have our ESP32 microcontroller and that talks via wired connection to our four individual motors and to our linear actuator. It talks via a wireless connection to our wireless controller, which also talks via Bluetooth to our camera. So, and as far as our rover power is concerned, we use a two cell, 6.6 .6 volt uh, light feed battery. It's got a capacity of 21 milli, 2100 milliamp hours, and it's just mounted to the bottom bracket, or the, the, excuse me, the bottom plate with a bracket and a little bit of tape to ensure that it doesn't This is a, a picture of our camera in its uh, actual mount for the contest. This is an ion snap cam. You can get them off Amazon for 20 bucks actually. It's a really cool tool. It's very similar to a GoPro, just not for the same price. It's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capable, and it's good up to about 50 feet away as we have found. And images can be stored on, a, on your uh, wireless device as you're taking them. You can also live stream, and there's an option to put an SD card in there with a program to actually say when to take pictures. Here we have some stuff about our rover power distribution. The, our 6.6 .6 volt battery powers the motors and actuator, and then the microcontroller. The wireless controller and the camera have their own rechargeable battery, so we effectively don't have to worry about that in our power budget. And if you can see it over here, our theoretical power budget uses about 3.8 amps for a total of just over 24 watt hours, and that seems like a really big number, and it's not gonna give us much operating time with this battery. However, we did some modifications to our servo motors, and since we don't have to account for the camera or the wireless controller in that power budget, since we're, they have their own batteries, we're actually only gonna use 1.46 amps under a max load. And this will give us about a 90 minute operating time with a max pull. That, that gives us plenty of time to turn the rover on and get it loaded into the Sabo, which goes into the rocket, and then get the rocket out to the launch pad and let it go in case we have a malfunction or we get held up at the launch pad, we'll have plenty of time to avoid having the rover die on us. And here's just a quick schematic of the rover electronics itself. We have the ESP32 microcontroller, then we have the motors over here. This H-bridge allows them, all the motors to turn um, a certain direction, whether it be all forward, all backward, or two forward and two backward, like the soil collection. And then we have our linear actuator and then our power system. As far as our software flowchart for the rover is concerned, once we turn the rover on, it goes into standby. And it just stays there until it senses our Wi-Fi connection with our ESP32. And once it gets that connection, the parachute disconnects and it then automatically rolls three feet. We have pre-programmed it to do that. And then it waits for a command. Once we give it the command to collect soil up here, it turns the motors on to collect soil by turning the back wedge forward and the front wedge backwards. And after several seconds of that, then it moves forward entirely to a different spot in order in case it didn't find a good spot the first time or just to get a new spot in general. And then this repeats itself five times until we have either gotten more soil than we need or the rover times out. After that, it goes back to standby mode and we wait for the command to take a picture. Once the picture is taken, the contest has thus ended and the rover goes into standby mode. A little bit about our handheld controller. We have a uh, very nice mock-up here made by Cadet Air. It's it's very, very basic. It just holds uh, two smartphones and a stylus. We're given extra points if we use a welding glove to interact with our handheld controller. And since we're using smartphones, touching a, a touchpad like that is not gonna work with a welding glove on. So that's why we use a stylus in order to get around that constraint and 
here's a, a more general CAD drawing of that. We've got the stylus holder, one phone, we have two phones. One is gonna be directly connected via Bluetooth, the camera, like I said, and the other one's gonna be directly connected via Wi-Fi to the microphone. And then here's a flow chart of our handheld controller software. It's extremely similar to the Rover software diagram, so I'm not gonna read it to you. But in essence, it's just from the controller. As far as rover testing goes, we tested each system independently first. We verified that it actually moved three feet with legs and then collect soil and take a picture. We also verified the parachute would attach correctly using that spring method I talked about earlier. And then when we integrated everything, we started with uh, the first system and then worked our way chronologically as if we were going throughout the contest to make sure we didn't have any failures or to create failures and not need more later. As far as rocket testing, on November 3rd, myself, Carl Squire, my dad, and my sister went out to a site in Monterey, Virginia to actually test fly a rocket. And as you can see here, we started at about an altitude of 775 meters, and we finished just over 1150. That gave us a total altitude of just over 1300 feet. So the rover was not in the rocket at the time. We didn't have it built. We had some ideas as to what we were going to do, but we were able to simulate the weight with it. So as you can see, we got well over what we needed to altitude-wise. And right here, you can see when the main parachute actually deployed after the apogee and how it slowly drifted off down to the ground. And obviously, this point's higher because it landed on its own. So it's still higher. So, and now I've got a, some special videos of our actual rocket testing for you guys. This one is actually from uh, one of the camera holders we have mounted on the side of the rocket about three feet up.
we have a video about our soil collection. You'll see uh, these two legs will be spinning forward because this is the back. This one will effectively be spinning toward the rear, and this one, inadvertently at the time, will be spinning forward. But this actually proved to be a good test for us to determine which uh, configuration of legs spinning would yield us the best soil collection. Here we, you can see our uh, very impromptu removable tray. It is collecting dirt, and there's also a lot of dirt getting dumped up in the bottle caps on the tops of the legs. I'm actually really impressed with the legs you see. So, an interesting thing to note about this is that we've talked to the contest organizers, and while the dirt must be placed in a closed removable container, such as the tinfoil one you see here, if the, we so choose, we can assume a wedge is a quote removable container by unscrewing it from the motor and just handing it over to them as that. So if we have a lot more soil just gummed up in a wedge, we can give them that and effectively uh, still have a removable container even if none ends up getting into the collection tray. And here we have uh, one of our favorite cadet hemp's throwing uh, our early version of the Sabo off of a roof. This was a test to see if a Sabo would actually open uh, with just a two by four and a parachute in it. We didn't want to test a rover the first time, so we thought we'd uh, be very rudimentary just to verify that the idea would in fact work. Here we have uh, a picture from yesterday's ejection test. This is everything packed into the rocket as neatly and carefully as it could have been. Uh, as you can see, there's not a lot of room there to work with, so we're, we're right on the edge of about how much we can put in there if anything. And then here we have, uh, whenever we were originally installing our Sabo onto our rover, this is uh, how we close it together. This, you can, just a better view of uh, how it fits in there. This area is uh, carved out for each As far as project management goes, this contest is going to be held March 30th uh, through 31, weather permitting. If the weather is exceptionally bad, we're going to have to find another day. However, we have worked with the contest organizers. As we all know, BMI is a pretty strict weekend schedule most of the time. As long as the weather is flyable, it doesn't have to be great, BMI will be allowed to fly. In other words, we might have, we will have less time than all the other teams, but we will still be given a chance to qualify for the contest. And Here's just a, one last happy picture of us this past weekend. We were out at the launch site actually trying to do a full system test, but the weather well, wasn't on our side and it was too wet. So we thought we would try to get some uh, soil collection testing while we were still out there, like at the, uh, at the actual site, just so we could verify that everything worked. And yes, it was very cold this time. <laughs> so one last thing before I conclude. There's a lot of people I want to thank for this, and if I miss you, I apologize, but I'd love to thank the ECE faculty, specifically uh, Miss Dong, Rick, Luke. They went through a lot of paperwork, ordering components, and getting travel arrangements done for us. I can't be more grateful than that. I'd like to thank my engineering team. These guys have done an awesome job so far this semester. They put in hundreds of hours at my last tally in order to make this project get to be where it is today. I'd like to thank my parents. They put up with me for 22 and a half years. I can't imagine that's very easy. I'd like to thank Colonel Squire. He presented this project to me. I never would have known about it otherwise. He's been there you know, every step of the way through this. I'd also like to thank Mrs. Squire for making dinner for me so many nights this past summer. It was really good. And I'd also like to thank the VCRU and the Wetmore. Without their funding, uh, this project would not have come in on budget. And obviously, we all know that poses some problems. So with that, I will leave it open to questions. And yes, this is